Are you ready for the Word today? Well, I'm excited about this. We're going to start a little mini-series today and over the next several weeks. And I entitled this, His Light for Our Darkest Days. His Light for Our Darkest Days. One of the things that I've always loved about Christmas is the emphasis on lights. I don't know if you do as well. Houses are decorated on the outside, on the inside. Lights are everywhere. Uh, Our staff usually spends a whole week decorating the church after our planning meeting. And, uh, you know, I just, I just love it. I love, I love looking around me, and I love seeing all the lights and, um, you know, looking in the neighborhood and all the neighbors' lights go on, and the Bosman's lights usually go on the day before Christmas. Uh, um, <laughs> that's, that's a true story. <laughs> We're always late because, you know, I, I, I don't want to put up lights, but then, then the boys are always like, come on, Dad, we need lights. And, they, you know, then I pay somebody to put up lights for a day or so. Uh, uh, but I, I, love what, I, I love what lights refer to, and, and uh, as the Bible t- says, that we are children of what? The of the light, and we know that Jesus is the light of the world, and He even refers to us as the light of the world, and our challenge is that uh, there is, a, there is a, a, a thing that can happen to us like we give it a sentimental attitude especially during Christmas time because we kind of, we are in that holiday mode and we either neglect or simply don't understand the power of God's light in the world that we're living in. Uh, December 21st is the winter solstice, which is the longest night of the year and the shortest time of daylight in the year. And here's what I love. I love the fact that we are in the darkest time of the year, even physically, and Jesus pierces the darkness. And I want you to know something today that actually more than, I, I don't just want you to perceive it, I, I want you to comprehend it, I want you to embrace it, and I want you to constantly pursue and understand God's light in your life. Lights were important in the first Christmas. Look at Luke uh, with me real quick, and I'm just going to kind of uh, work our way through this uh, today, and I want to get somewhere that's very important. I hope it's not going to be too theological. Uh, uh, you know me, I don't try to be too theological, but I, I do want to... Uh, 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 talk about something that I believe is crucial. And look what the Bible says in Luke 2 verse 8. It says, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them. And I I love these words. And the radiance, somebody say radiance. Radiance. Look at this, of the Lord's what? Glory surrounded them. So the angels are surrounded by the glory of the Lord, which is a radiant light. So you got light and the Bible says they were so happy. No, they were terrified. How many of you know you'd be terrified as well? The angel appeared in God's radiance, and the shepherds went to Bethlehem as a result and saw the baby Jesus. But the wise men saw another bright light in the sky, a star. And we'll talk about the wise men over the next several weeks. And they followed it to where the Savior was born. Light is a major theme in the Bible. First John says, God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. The very first command in creation is what? Let there be light. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. This is the very reason we have Christmas. John 12, 46, out of the Living Bible, Jesus said, I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer wander in darkness. In John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness. Why? Because you will have the Light that leads to life. How many of you want the light that leads to life? How many of you have the light that leads to life? Here's the thing, the reality that I, 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 the picture that I believe we need to see. Everybody has dark days. Uh, You know, there are days where you don't want to do anything. You you feel immobilized and you really don't want to, you don't want to see any people. You don't like the people as a matter of fact. And uh, sometimes even in days like that where you feel, you, you feel like, you know, you ask yourself, why even make an effort? Uh, you know, things don't turn out anyway. Have you ever been in that place where you feel punch drunk by the circumstance of life? And you're tempted to just throw in the towel and you begin to withdraw and you isolate yourself from healthy community and positive people annoy you. How many of you know that uh, when you're in a place like that and people, you know, quote a verse or whatever, you get annoyed at it. Instead of, you know, instead of being brave, you get annoyed. It doesn't make you really happy. And the reality is we all go through dark days. Now, I, I, I want to dig this out as a foundation and then I want to kind of weave my way through this this morning. Dark days can lead to several things. Let me just give them to you. Here's the first one. It can lead to a sense of disillusionment. 
Uh, uh, Job says this, Job 30, 26. So I looked for good, but evil came instead. Now, let me just stop there. How, has anybody of you ever looked for good and you found evil? Yeah. Yeah. We all have, right? He says, I waited for the light, but darkness fell. Job, Job is disillusioned because what he's expecting is not what he's receiving. What he's hoping for is not coming to pass. And, and when you're in a dark day, it can lead to that. You can be in a place of disillusionment. Secondly, uh, uh, feelings of helplessness. Psalm 109, 22, I am poor and helpless and very sad. I, I love how clearly the Bible communicates the sense where people were in the Bible. How many of you know it's clear? It kind of reminds me of the little boy that got separated from his mom at the Temecula Valley Mall, and he was standing by the door crying, and people coming in, you know, looked at him, and some, as they started, came and started giving him some money. And uh, so the mall security came over and uh, said to him, say, don't worry, son, I, I, I found your mother. I know where she is. And the little boy just said, please, be quiet. I know where she is as well. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to make a plan, right? You just don't feel, you, maybe you're not as helpless as you seem. My guess is that some of you are feelings of helplessness right now, and you may be stressed out financially. There's too much month left, you know, over after the end of your money. I heard of a guy that went to the creditor and said, hey, listen, we're having trouble with your easy payment plan. Do you have a no payment plan? And uh, you can feel physically helpless. You, your get up and go has went. It's no longer going anywhere. You, you don't feel good and you don't feel like doing anything. And maybe relationally, your marriage isn't working out right. And maybe relationships are not working out in your family, with your kids, with your friends, with your boss. And when you don't know what to do in order to bring about reconciliation in a relationship, guess what? We feel helpless. We, we even ask the question, what can I do about this? A third thing that it leads to, it leads to a lack of direction. John 12, 35, those who walk in the dark don't know where they're going. And sometimes we are like that. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Landon uh, bought a parrot. And uh, the only thing that it said, it's, let's make out. And uh, he went back to the owner of the uh, pet store and he told him, he said, listen, man, hey, I, I just want you to know I'm a youth pastor. Kids come over to my house. I can't have a bird saying, let's make out all the time. So the guy says, you know what, I, I think I have the solution for you. I have another bird here. All it says is, let us pray. And uh, he says, maybe, maybe you should buy this one and put him with the other one, and the good guy will influence the bad guy. So he bought the second parrot, and uh, he took him home, left him in the cage with the other parrot for a week. After a week, the first parrot was still saying, let's make out. And the second one started saying, my prayers have been answered. <laughs> Sometimes you just lack direction. Are you with me? That could lead us to thoughts of depression. Lamentations write this. It says, remember my suffering and my aimless wandering, the wormwood and poison. My soul continues to remember these things and is so discouraged. Sometimes when you go through things in life and sometimes when there's so much difficulty in life and it's hard and you kind of try to navigate through it and, and, you, and you feel like you say, and you start remembering, you're remembering all the, the challenges, you're remembering the suffering, you're remembering the aimlessness you, and you kind of say, I don't know what to do and your soul gets discouraged or even depressed and, and thoughts of depression just kind of rack your mind and that could lead us to a loss of perspective. Psalm 88, 18 says, Lover, friend, acquaintance, all are gone. There's only darkness everywhere. Uh, David is in this position where everybody has left him, and he says, you know what, I just, I, 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 I don't know. There's nobody around, and my, my, my friends are gone. My acquaintances are gone. The people that I counted on are gone, and all that's left is darkness everywhere. Now, I've got good news for you today. If you're in any part of that, God's remedy for your dark days is Jesus. John 1, 4, listen to this. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. I love this. I love the fact that in Matthew, when we read about the fact when Jesus came, I love the, the wise men and their pursuit. What impresses me about the story of the wise men is that they had a goal, and they had a single pursuit to follow the light. And they persistently followed the star, and they finally arrived at their destination. So here's the question that I have for you. What do you do when you face dark days? I just got a, a thought that I want to wrap. Here's what you do. You follow the light despite the difficulties. You follow the light despite the difficulties. 
When we read about the wise men, because they're called wise men in the Bible, the, use, the word used here is magoi uh, in the Greek. It's the plur plural of magos, and uh, it means magician. But it's not a magician in the way that we know it in the modern sense of a performer or a conjurer. They were scholars. They were men of science. They were keepers of ancient knowledge, important advisors to kings. They were experts in astronomy. And the term wise men is, is, a, is probably a responsible way to describe them, or magi. Historians tell us that when the Magi traveled, they usually had a military escort. And depending on how many of them were there, they could have up to a thousand troops protecting them. They were very valuable men, highly respected advisors of kings. They came from the east, probably Persia or old Babylon or modern-day Iraq. There is no reason to believe that there were three of them. I think that's kind of uh, what we conjure up, you know, from songs, these three th kings that travel afar. And the idea probably comes from the gifts that they gave. And, uh, but how many of you know that's just a myth? And uh, it would have taken these uh, magi a while to get to Jerusalem. They had to travel almost a thousand miles. And how many of you know they couldn't jump a flight? Are you with me? Uh, the trip would have required planning and, and equipment and uh, a contingency of military people traveling with them. They, they would have had to put all this together. And uh, it may have been a year after they saw the star that they finally arrived in Jerusalem. And here's the thing. They did not come to Bethlehem. They came to Jerusalem, the capital city. And that's where, why. Because that's where they would have expected to find a king. And they came to Herod and asked, where is that, uh, that, born, that, that king born of the Jews? And For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. How many of you know that God sent a very special star? And I know we call it a star, but it probably is not. It appeared on the night that Jesus was born, and somehow God used it to reveal to them the promised king of the Jews that had been born. Ages ago, during the, the Jewish captivity in Babylon, and I love the fact that it comes from the roots there. Daniel, the prophet, lived there, and Daniel became one of these magi, one of these scholars of Babylon. And his influence and his teachings obviously were probably passed down in traditions to these scholars, and he would have told them, and they would have known the visions that he saw about this promised one, the Messiah, who would be born of the Jews. And from the descriptions we have in the Bible, the stars, uh, the star appearance and movement, it, it could not have been an actual star. How many of you know that? Yes. It could not have been a comet or a, a comet or a supernova or a conjunction of planets, because people make up all kinds of stuff that's really not biblical. The natural explanations that you read into the story do not fit the recorded facts. The word translated as star is aster, which simply means a lighted object in the sky. It was used to describe stars, planets, meteors, uh, uh, comets, or any bright object in the sky. Notice that the Bible does not say that the star led them there. They did not come to Bethlehem after they saw it. They went to Jerusalem, and it wasn't until they left Jerusalem to go to Bethlehem that the star appeared again and led them. And, and there's a truth there that maybe we can't unwrap it fully, but there's a truth there to understand that when God reveals light to you and you see His initial light, you got to continue following even if you don't see it anymore. Yeah. Because look at Matthew 2, 9. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen. Somebody say, had seen. had seen. So that doesn't mean they saw the star all the way. It means they saw it initially. They had an initial revelation of a star or of a bright light. And then they, because of they were men that were studying, they saw that this is different. And then they said to themselves, they were not sure this might be the very thing that we've been looking for. This might be the very fulfillment of prophecy. So what are we going to do? We are going to prepare like it is. So they prepared like it was, and that's why they came prepared. But that's why they went to the wrong address. Why? Because men don't ask directions. That's why we know they were men, right? They were not women. But look at this. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Now look at verse 10. When they saw the what? They what? Rejoiced. Now why would you rejoice at something that you're seeing all the time? Do you, do you get that? So no actual star, meteor, comet, or conjunction of planets could behave in that particular way. We know that it was a supernatural light from God. 
then appeared again almost a year later to guide them south from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. And it pointed out the actual place where Jesus was living. How many of you know light will always lead to Jesus? Yeah. Because no natural explanation can account for this. That This was a special light sent from God, unlike anything we have observed in nature. There's no star mentioned appearing in Bethlehem on the night that Jesus was born. The star was seen by the wise men while they were back in the east on that night. It may or may not have been visible from Bethlehem or from Jerusalem on the night of his birth. It was only after they left Jerusalem to go to Bethlehem that that same supernatural light in the sky guided them to the home where Jesus was then living. Let me tell you something. When you are in dark days, you've got to continue living in the light, the revelation of what God has already spoken to you. Secondly, if you understand that, here's what's going to happen. You must trust that God will speak a language you understand. How many of you know God knows how to talk to you better than anybody else knows how to talk to you? God, unlike some preachers, doesn't confuse the message. We, as a matter of fact, do. The beautiful story about Christmas is God's ability to communicate in our language. In other words, He has the ability to take us where we are. Like these wise men were Chaldeans, they were stargazers. They knew the heavens, they knew the stars. And then when they saw the star unlike any other they've seen before, it didn't fit into the general plan of things. And because they understood the heavens and made a study of it, they realized that this must be the sign of the Christ child. A king, a new king to be born. And they began to pursue and follow that star to find out about the king. Look again here. Where, where is the new king of the Jews? This is Matthew 2.2. 2. We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. This, the message of Christmas is God communicating in our language. For the magi who put a star in the heavens. For the shepherds, it was angels. Now, you have to understand that for shepherds, one of the pursuits was the study of angelology, and that was the study and pursuit of them. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a saying among shepherds of the day, as they would go out, especially at night, they would say, may you see the fluttering of angel wings. So how does God speak to the shepherds? He brings an angel. That's how we announce. How does he speak to the Magi? He speaks through the stars. God has the ability to communicate through languages that we understand. That's the story of Christmas. That's the story of the incarnation. God spoke to us by bringing His Son, how? In the flesh, we call it the incarnation. What is the one thing that we all understand? We understand how we got here. Come on, work with me. Do I need to explain biology? Mama cow, papa cow comes together. You, you all know that, right? It takes a mama and a papa cow. Are, are you with me? To get, a, to get a calf. And so it's the same thing. Mommy and daddy produce a child. We know. How, how did we get you? We were born. So when God wants to communicate to you and I, what does he do? Now I want you to hang with me because I want to communicate this in a way so that you understand that Christmas is not just about clapping. It's not just singing about carols. It's not just about food. It's about the fact that we can rejoice because our darkest days are over because he has become the light of our lives. So I want, to go, I want to take you to two places. I want you to track with me, and I'll try to communicate this in a way that we all can understand. I want you to go to John 1 in your Bibles, and then go to 1 John. It's the same guy who wrote it. Let's go to John 1, and just as a foundation, let me just read this. You don't, you don't have to check this out, but look at this. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed when? In the beginning, in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word, that's the living word, gave what? Life to everything that was created, and his life brought what? Light to everyone. And look at this, verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. John describes Christ coming into the world as the word. Now, in 1 John, he begins to talk about the incarnation and God becoming flesh. Why does God come as a baby? Because we understand babies. Look at verse 1 with me, 1 John 1, 1. I'm going to take a few verses, and then I'm going to try to explain it to you. We proclaim to you the one who existed from when? The beginning whom we have heard and seen. 
We saw him with our own eyes, and we touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is what? He was with the Father and then was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that. Somebody say, so that. So Come on, say it again. So that. so that you may have what? Fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. Now, I want you to hang with me because I just want to look at the, the first part of this, this phrase when John writes in verse 1. Look, at, look what he says. He says, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. Now, I don't want to get technical, but what he was saying, because it, it, the, the Greek is in the neuter sense. So it is, that means what I'm telling you, it's something that has already existed before. That something, that something that was born in Bethlehem existed before it existed in the flesh. In other words, when Christ was born, that did not begin His existence. It began His existence in the flesh. But He is the I Am. He was from the beginning God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He always was. It is now that he is taking the form of flesh. And so when John said, I want you to understand this beautiful Christmas story, he's saying God, the Christ child, was already in existence from the very beginning. So you need to understand that. So God brings Jesus into the world, not for his sake, but for our sake, because it's the only thing that we can understand. He wants to communicate to us in a way that we can grasp. It's called incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us. But then he goes on because John wants to know because he knows that there are people that are going to kind of like, oh, well, we're not sure about this. How many of you know uh, it's very difficult when you say God is born as a baby? Because all the gods in those age were powerful and great and all this. Why would God come in the most vulnerable of ways? Now he says this, he says, whom we have heard and seen. Now, that phrase in the Greek is what we call the perfect tense, which means that it is functioning at the present moment. In other words, John writes and he is saying, this is written, and by the way, this is written about 50 or, or 60 years after the birth of Christ. He is saying a half a century has passed and his voice is still ringing in my ear. Yes. John is saying, as I'm writing this today, that which came that which was always in existence, that which was born in Bethlehem, the voice of Jesus still rings in my ear. I can still hear His voice. Wow. He goes on and He says this, we saw Him with our own eyes and we touched Him with our own hands. So, so what is He trying to communicate? He's trying to let you know He is not talking from secondhand information. So, because why is that? That's in what we would term the perfect tense. In other words, he, this is what he's saying. He says, the intangible became tangible at Bethlehem. I can still see him. I can still hear his voice. I can still mentally see him in my mind. The vision of him still lingers in my mind. Why? Because I knew I touched him and I was with him. Now, here's what's powerful. He leaves the perfect tense, and then he goes into the Greek in what we would term the aros tense, which is the past tense. Are you still tracking with me? I, I know we're not Greek scholars, but I'm trying to show you something, which means, here's what it means. It means it's over. Somebody say, it's over. In other words, what he's literally saying is it suddenly dawned on us who he was. He says, it's over. We finally got it. How many of you know in the beginning they didn't get it? It finally dawned on us that this was God. He is, that's why he makes this term, he is the word of life. The vision still lingers. I can still hear his words. But he said there was a time when we could handle him with our hands. In other words, he says that eternal something took on a physical body. And we could actually handle God himself. That's amazing. If you would allow me, let me paraphrase this verse. Can I paraphrase it for you? Will you allow me to do that? Even if you don't, I did it anyway, so I'm going to do it. 
This is what he's saying. He says the eternal invaded the temporal and became part of human history. We saw it. We heard it. We handled it. And we realized that Jesus was the very word of life and light. And we can still hear his voice ringing in our ears. And we grasp that he is our savior. That's my paraphrase that I wrote for you. You see, God communicates to you exactly where you live. See, researchers tell us that 89% of everything that we know in this room right now, 89% of what you know online, 89% of what you know right now, you know it because you saw it visually. We learned it visually. In other words, through the eyes. 89% of everything you know, you know how, visually. So obviously God wants you to see what he's communicating. 10% is audio or through the ears and 1% through the other senses. So why do you think the enemy is trying to contend for you to look at things that you shouldn't look at or look at, why? Because he's trying to create pictures in your mind that creates habits in your life that brings you not to the destination that God has intent. Darkness is seen in the same way that light is seen. So what does God do? God communicates at Christmas in the way that we are going to know most about God. Not but just by being God, the creator of the heavens and earth, whose ways and thoughts are way above us, but God in the flesh that we can see Him, we can hear Him, we can feel Him, we can walk with Him, and we can know Him. Something we can see visually, and that's exactly what John is writing. He says, I want you to know I touched Him, I felt Him, I saw Him, I heard Him. You see, God didn't just want you to feel his love. He wanted you to see his love. He gives it in the package of Jesus. And that, my friend, is the greatest answer to any day that might be dark that you might be facing. Because of Christmas, you don't have to stay in the dark. Let me read Matthew 4.12, and I'll, I'll kind of bring this to a close. Matthew 4.12 says, when Jesus heard, and I want you to listen to the circumstance. Are you ready? Look at that. When Jesus heard what? John had been arrested. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested. Think about that. When Jesus heard that John, this is John the Baptist, had been arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth, then left there and moved to Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali. This fulfilled, somebody say this fulfilled, what God said through the prophet Isaiah in the land of Zebulon and of Naphtali beside the sea beyond the Jordan River in Galilee where so many Gentiles live. Listen to this. The people who sat where? In darkness have what? Seen a great light. And for those who lived in the land where death cast its shadow, a light has shined. From then on. Somebody say, from then on. Come on, say it again. Jesus began to preach. What did he preach? Repent of your sins and turn to God. Why? For the kingdom of heaven is near you. Notice that this happens the moment that Jesus hears John is arrested. John the Baptist is about to lose his head, and I would call that a very dark day, wouldn't you? The challenge is that we have is that when we are faced with difficulties or even dark days, we somehow feel that or at least act like that the light that we have received is not greater than the darkness we face. But I've got good news for you today. Light always expels and overcomes the darkness. No matter how dark it is, Jesus' light is greater than the darkness that you sit in. It might even be the shadow of death, but I want you to know the shadow of death cannot shine if the light of Christ is in the building. Mm. Let's look at the last few verses of 1 John 1, and then I promise you I'll close. Look at this. We are writing these things so that you may what? Fully... Share our what? Come on, help me. Come on, help me again. Tell me that. So he says, I just told you this. I just told you about the incarnation so that you can fully what? Have fellowship with us. But when you have fellowship with us, what are you going to share? You're going to share what? 
our joy. Why can we share joy in the midst of the worst circumstance of life? Because Christ has come in the flesh, and we've handled him, we've seen him, and he has overcome. Look at this. This is the message we heard from Jesus, and now declare it to you. Who did they hear the message from? Jesus, and who are they telling? Us. God is what? Light, and there is no darkness in him at all. Mm. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is where? In the light, then what do we have? Fellowship with who? Each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from what? All sin. Jesus dispels the darkness in my life. And when I think about Christmas, it's, it's amazing to me about the star that the wise men followed, the light that they followed from the east. Because yes, 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 when you have something so visible, how many of you know other people had to see it as well? It was in the sky. How many of you know you can see a little light from miles and miles and miles away? It was in the sky. Anybody could see it. Probably hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people saw this bright, unusual light. But guess what? They didn't do anything about it. See, wise men paid the price and followed. That's why they called wise. It's one thing to know there's a light in the world. It's another thing to follow the light. See, this morning you have one or two choices. You have a choice to live in your darkness or follow the light. You can choose to live in the darkness of your soul or you can choose to live in the light that he has revealed. God shines the sun on everybody, the Bible says, but you can go live in a cave. That's your choice. God shows you the light, but you can choose to go blindfolded through it and say, well, there's just not enough proof. How many of you know there's proof enough because God became a baby? What I love about my awesome God is that he communicates in a way that's non-threatening. He communicates in a way, see, what we want, we want we, we want explosions, and we want, I mean, bro, that's what we want. We want, yeah, we want the hype. We want all of that. And God says, no, I'll, I'll, I'll show you how powerful I am. I am going to overcome, and all I need is a baby. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> you see, that's when you know you God, because you don't need to show off. Yeah. Wow. People say, well, God needs to show to me. Uh, he's God. He needs to not show you nothing. He's already shown you everything he's going to show you. And that's through the life of Christ. It's, it's you that have to decide he's either the light or he's not. He was born in the flesh, born of a virgin. Emmanuel, God with us. We saw him. We, we have eyewitness account of people who handled him, saw him, felt him. People who at first who did not believe. Even after the resurrection, they had trouble believing. How many of you know they thought they were looking at a ghost? But then what does Jesus say? Come over here and what? Touch me. Feel me. Touch me. Are you with me, somebody? God shows you the light, but you can choose the darkness, or you can say, well, I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to do my own thing. And how many of you know, you say you are open-minded, but you've already closed your mind to the ability of God in your life. And you will forever live in that darkness because you refuse the one that was in the flesh for you. If you want to get out of the dark days, then you must choose to start living in the light, and you must follow the light, even though it might be difficult. Let's bow our heads this morning. I want to pray with you and for you, and I'm just going to simply ask, if you're in this room and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you've never accepted him as the light that brings life, then I'm going to give you that opportunity to do that right now, online, outside, inside, if that's you, yes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three, and then I'm going to clap my hands together. And if that's you, and you say, Henny, I want today, I want to take the blindfolds off. 
Today I want to come out of the cave. Today I want, I want the light of Christ to shine in my life. I want the darkness to be dispelled. Then I'll pray for you. Are you ready? We're going to count to three. Clap my hands. And when I clap my hands, just pop your hand up. Online, you can just use the hand raise emoji. Outside, you can just pop your hand up. Somebody will see that and acknowledge that. Are you ready to do that today? Are you ready to make that decision? To follow the light, Jesus Christ. One, two, three. Just pop your hand up and let me see it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you, 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 thank you. I see that. Thank you. You can put that down. Thank you. Back there, you can put it down. Thank you. To my left, you can put it down. There, to my right, you can put it down. Thank you. Thank you. I see that. God bless you. Thank you, young man. I see that. I see that back there. Thank you. You can put it down. God bless you. God bless you. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. There's no magic in this prayer. This is not an abracadabra prayer. It's just a way of bringing our hearts before the Lord. And I'm going to ask everybody online, pray this with us inside this room. Pray this with us. Just pray this out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you were born for me, God in the flesh. I thank you that there's eyewitness account of your life, that you were touched you were seen, you were heard, and today I heard your voice calling me home. I repent of my sin. I ask you, give me the light of Christ so that I may walk in the life of Christ. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Thank you that you wash me and cleanse me by your blood, and today Today, today, I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. Save me now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.